welcome 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 to our soulful morning welcome to our beautiful world of going inwards diving inwards let's start this wonderful day by being aligned with our breath take a deep breath in and gently exhale have a deep breath in feel the breath movement and as you exhale be so grateful for this natural gift and take another deep breath in the last time for this morning a conscious breath hold it for 3 seconds and as you exhale just say thank you when we tune into our breath not only do we get centered balanced aligned we are once again grateful for the gifts that we receive without even knowing this breath is so important without this we'd be gasping for air without this there is no life and it's so expensive if you have to buy it but we have been given this as blessings so may we count our blessings so much whenever we can and whenever we feel low in life may we remember to just take five or 10 deep breaths that time by closing our eyes and automatically our energy changes when you think about how wonderfully you've been gifted and now it's that time of the morning to count our 10 blessings in about 100 seconds by practicing lotus of gratitude let's do that and connect once again life is so expansive with each breath our body expands with each breath going out the body shrinks automatically the process is going on of becoming big and becoming small Can we relate that to our ego as a human being? It's natural to get sucked into this world of ego. We 
when you get some financial thing or some respect or something from someone, sometimes you feel overconfident. Sometimes you feel egoistic. But when somebody just disrespects us or something is taken away from us, we feel hurt, sad. And we feel that our ego has been, you know, hampered. So can we try and just let this go gradually? In one day, nothing happens. They say all lead, roads lead to Rome. So what road do we need to take? When we have been given the gift of love and light as our spiritual DNA, what if we start practicing at least five acts of kindness, compassion, empathy, love and light every single day? Then within five days, you will find a major shift in your consciousness, more of ascension of yours, gradual removal of ego. What is the need for this I, me and am? And on our own, we can't do anything. And so is the belief of all of us because we aren't atheists. When we know that our world expands with gratitude, when we know our heart expands, when we act out of our heart's most beautiful quality of love, when we know we are capable of giving so much love and receiving so much love. When we know that what we give is what we get, but we often get disillusioned that if I get this, then I will do this. So many times, even when we go to pray, and we're waiting for some result or something. Only if I get this, Bhagavanji, I'm going to be giving you so much. Or I'm going to do this act. We are so conditional at times. Can we just let these conditions be completely a thing of the past? Can we tune into the gratitude that we have for this magical body that we've been given? Hmm. A body that helps us do whatever we do. Waking up in the morning also, maybe you feel lazy, the winters are coming in. But so what? Look at our bodies. They've woken us up. They've tuned us in. So first, most gratitude is towards this temple that we actually live in, we actually worship our bodies. Rub your hands together. And bless your entire body by touching every inch of it. In whichever manner you wish to do, top to bottom, Bottom to top, left to right, right to left. Every part of your body needs to be blessed. This body is so beautiful. And now, keep your hands largely on your diaphragm, on your chest, from where you breathe. And now see, your stomach is expanding slowly and contracting. So maybe one hand on your chest, one hand on your 
stomach. And just see how beautifully, without even taking conscious effort, your body is expanding and shrinking. And equally so, right? Whatever we're getting is whatever we're giving. It's it's a it's a life lesson. Equality. And now, while your hands are still here, in resonance with the breath, can we look back to just yesterday? We got the gift. And we gave the gift. Whatever. What all did we get yesterday? Right now, when you come to your gratitude, you don't realize that yeah, you're thankful for this, 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 this. Now, can we do the lotus of gratitude for ourselves or what we did for others? With acts of love, compassion, kindness. If not 10, then at least 5. And that 5 without ego. Did you do it for your name, fame, or unconditionally? And automatically you will tune in to how little you give. And if you do have 10 acts of unconditional love, kindness, empathy on daily level, then you are on the process of becoming the, the nicest person, the kindest person. A person towards enlightenment. With a self check. And with this, let's just pray to the universe to give each one of us opportunities, opportunities to grow expansive, to indulge in acts of kindness on a daily level. And let's affirm, I am open and receptive to all the blessings, to all the love, to all the abundance, to all the magical synchronicities, to the growth mindset, to the growth being. I'm open and receptive to divine synchronicities, to luck. And I claim that I am lucky. I am always at the right place at the right time. The right mentors, teachers, gurus, nudging me, prodding me, guiding me in the right direction in all spheres of my life. In all aspects of my life, I grow tremendously. I evolve on a daily level. I am love. I am light. I am abundance. I am blessings. I am healing. And this is me. I claim it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's bow in gratitude to all our masters, angels, guides, spirit guides, teachers, gurus, mentors, in this realm or the other, in this dimension or the other, in this plane or the other, for their presence, for their direction, for all that they give and do for us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I start this beautiful morning once again. Today, hopefully, the last day, of our wonderful book, Miracles Happen. I think it should be the last, I'm not sure. But I think it should be. <clears throat> Here we are. We start with this story called, The End is Only the Beginning. I attended one of Dr. Weiss's Path Life Regression Seminars in 2010 in Denver, Colorado. Only seven months prior to this event, I lost my sweetheart, Christian, to a sudden and unexpected death. It was the worst thing I'd ever experienced, and it left me 
a basket case with so many painful thoughts and questions. At the same time, I also spontaneously remember a tragic past life with Christian and me that ended in a similar fashion, which left me feeling even worse. Because I was so distraughtful about these losses, Christian's aunt told me about Dr. Wise and recommended that I go to an event saying that maybe I could find some answers or at least feel better. I looked him up and read the books and they gave me some peace of mind. And when I found out that he was going to be close as Colorado, I took the opportunity to travel and attend his event. My experience there was helped. My experience there has helped me so much by changing my perspective. It was the first regression of the day after Dr. Weiss had introduced me himself and prepared us for what might be expected and unexperienced within the context of our time with him. And he put us into a deep sleep of hypnotic regression, of course expected to go into a past life, just I had done times before while listening to his regression CD. I remember that he had just come to the part where he gives the suggestion to go back to the earliest childhood memory, which I did. Like a child, I found myself in wonder and anticipation of the adventure I would soon discover when he took me back to a previous life. What past life clues and remnants would I uncover? What would they teach me about my life and myself? I can't be really exactly certain of the words he spoke at the moment of crossing over the threshold between this life and another one. But what I heard was to step towards the door and step into the light. I did so with no hesitation. To my delighted surprise, I found myself drawn into a tunnel of beautiful light. When he asked us to look down to see what type of footwear clothing we were wearing, I was taken aback to see that my feet were bare and that I was wearing a long robe-like gown. In an instant, I realized where I must have been, and although it didn't take much sense to my brain, I went with experience. It was as real as if my eyes were wide open. Within the tunnel of this warm illumination, I saw the figures of beings. I did not see their faces, but I could see strong presence. The predominant presence I felt was the spirit of my mother, who crossed over nearly 40 years ago when I was just a girl. There were others too, but I was so enamored by the energy of the light that I could not shift my focus away from it. I became aware that I was weightless and I was experiencing this wonderful news floating sensation. Every part of me felt as if it were being immersed and bathed in the sweetest, most cleansing energy. It was as though I had died and gone to heaven. The bliss was consuming and there was nowhere that love was not. I remember thinking that I could stay in this loving light forever feeling so peaceful and fulfilled. I knew there was nothing that I could ever want or need again. Next, without knowing how I got there, I went from floating in the tunnel to some sort of transition area. It seemed like a hospital, except there was more of the equipment than you would normally see in a hospital on Earth. I knew what it looked like because I was in two places at the same time. I was both consciously observing and experiencing what was happening while I lay unconscious. I saw myself lying on a flat, illuminated surface, which for lack of a better word, I will call a bed. This bed was most curious. I could both see and feel its amazing pulsating energy. I could feel its subtle vibration. It appeared to be made of smooth crystalline rocks, which radiated brightly as it so amazingly energized my spirit and soul. It had a magnetic quality about it. And like the light in the tunnel, the bed was alive with intelligence. I could feel that something extremely special was happening to me. It seemed to have a healing, restorative quality and effect about it. I watched while the unconscious part of me lay there, lifeless, while my sweetheart Christian, who had passed only seven months earlier, was trying to rouse me to awareness of this heavenly realm. Although there was a very conscious part of me in that heavenly realm, another part of my consciousness was still lagging behind, maybe in the bliss of the tunnel or perhaps still in the light that had been departed. Interestingly enough, the conscious me 
somehow knew information surrounding my death. I knew that it was sudden and unexpected. I knew it had something to do with my throat area. I got the impression that the cause of death was asphyxiation. I may have choked, but the point that fascinated me was that the sleeping one I was observing on that bed, did you not yet know that she had left the earthly realm? In her life, what had surfaced as previous past lives for her were many memories of dying horrible deaths while staying in the body until the last terrifying gasp of air. But this time was different because her spirit had left before seeing the face of death. There was no struggle. Not even a hint of pain or fear involved with the process. So there was no realization yet of a passing. The body just died without drama and now she found herself experiencing this incredible peace and freedom. From the perspective of the sleeping beauty lying there, I had the sensation of being in a deep dream state from which I was ever so slowly waking up, as if from a strong dose of anesthesia. As I was coming to, I, was, I could hear my beloved Christian speaking faintly at first, its words rendering, getting louder. I heard him say, Sweetheart, wake up. It's me. Come on, love. Wake up. I'm here with you. As I heard these words in the far off distance, I'm, I was confused about where to focus my consciousness, which was a dream and which was a reality of my situation. I could both see and sense the presence of other loved ones with me, all of my beloveds watching over me with great care and attention, awaiting the reunion of that very moment when I could wake up from my slumber and open my eyes to be greeted and welcomed into the overflowing joy that love is. It reminded me so much of the mood of anticipation and excitement that is present when a new baby is about to come in the world. As I mentioned before, I was encountering this whole scene from what seemed to be two quite different perspectives. It was fascinating. For what I am realizing is a possible third perspective. I experienced them both and now another one is writing the both of them. Perhaps they are all aspects of me only separated by diverse events in time. It was only because of the particular spirits who had previously passed before me that I believed that I was witnessing the actual death of my current earthly life. But as I said, it seemed to be more about a birth than into a wonderful new existence, one to which I needed to adjust and acclimatize or acclimate rather than a death. I never got to wake up from an unconscious state to see what happened because it was at this time that Kuwais began the process of bringing us back in trauma hypnotic state and into the awareness of this earthly life. After it returned, it took me a few minutes to begin to realize the implication of what had just occurred. In fact, several weeks later, I'm still trying to comprehend them. However, despite my lack of full comprehension, this incident has given me so much more than I could ever have thought to ask for. It gave me the personal comfort of knowing that Christian will not only be there to greet me when I cross over, but then her love continues on. It has also helped me to deal with my fears about my own eventual passing. By previewing and experiencing my death, I realize there is nothing I need to be afraid of when it is my turn to walk through death's door. For beyond that threshold is unimaginable freedom and bliss. I am forever thankful that I was given the wonderful opportunity. It has truly been a gift, says Jade Kramer. What if death is really just a birth into a beautiful realm of peace? A realm in which, as Jade says, there is nowhere that love is not. What if our departed loved ones gather with great anticipation to welcome our birth on the other side, to be reunited once again? Then like Jade and Nathiel, we would lose our fear of death and we would embrace life with more joy and more purpose. In my book, Same Soul, Many Bodies, I document numerous pre-cognitive dreams and journeys to the near and far future. 
which is entirely feasible because as modern physics describes, time is relative and quite different from our conscious perceptions and understanding. It is possible to see the future. Recently, a woman responding to an interview of mine with a description of her own near-death experience unknowingly echoed Jade's words. I realize that life is like a dream, she wrote. When you are born, you wake up with, into mortality in this physical body. When your physical body dies, you return to immortality. I'm not afraid to die anymore. It's like going home. We sang this truth as children, yet as adults we have forgotten. Life is but a dream. And how merrily we must partake in it as we sail down the same as the stream of time. The author Catherine Frank writes about time as a deep and deep pool rather than a fast flowing river. What if time was indeed more like a lake than a swift stream, having depth instead of flow? All our memories, thoughts, and actions are stored there and can be retrieved by entering those deeper waters. They do not flow away, they are never lost. We can enter the water whenever we wish. And when we are finished with time, we walk out of the lake and sit on its shore. As everyone we have ever known and loved comes to welcome it back. And the brilliant light restores our soul. Both Jade and Nath Nathaniel and countless people across the world who have shared the experiences with me call the shore bliss. It is bliss. It is the source. Every word, every page of this book tells its story. It is all breath from which the cosmos is created. It existed before and beyond all dimensions. It precedes all space, all emptiness, all matter, all force and all energies. It is a timeless precursor of all that is. It is the origin of the field and by all intentions, it is love itself. And it is what just begets love. It is known by many names, but is beyond knowing. It is our true home. It is where we take off our bodies and our masks one last time and cast them into the edge of eternity. It is where we finally realize that most in transcendent truth of our soul's everlasting nature of its journey into the beautiful dream which is life. It is where after thousands and thousands of years, thousands and thousands of dreams we awaken and it is where after thousands and thousands of births we are born. The end is only the beginning. Now we come to the acknowledgement section. Our deepest appreciation goes to Gideon Well, an extraordinary editor at Harper One. Gideon's masterful insights and inspired vision for this book upon reading the first draft resonated deeply with both of us and we knew that we had found the persistent collaborator. Thank you also to production editor Suzanne Quist, assistant director Babbitt, Nunkelgrun, and the entire Harper One team for skillful work on this book. We appreciate everything we do. We're grateful to Tracy Fisher, a remarkable agent at William Morris Endeavor, whose help has been invaluable throughout the years. She expertly guided this project since inception. Our thanks also extend to the assistant Pauline Post for all her efforts and enthusiastic support. We are indebted to all the organizations that have hosted our events over the years, provide the force for many of the miracles described in the book. In particular, Omega Institute has offered constant support in an idyllic healing environment for larger workshops and retreats. Special thanks to Carol Donho for facilitating these fantastic events at Omega. Hay House has expertly organized most of our full day seminars as well as some longer ones. We especially want to thank Reed Tracy, CEO of Hay House, and both Molly Langer and Nancy Levin, who have tirelessly helped us to touch the lives of thousands of workshop participants. For his wise advice and input, as well as his story, and thanks and love to go to Jordan Wise. We would like to acknowledge the loving and loyal S, who's being biting commentary literally shaped the pages of this book. This book would not have been possible, would not exist without the 68 wonderful contributors who shared their words with the world. Our own words cannot express how grateful we are to you. 
and there's a big thank you for about 50 odd people and that's how this book ends so now today it's time for us to start a new book and now that we have half an hour i think it's easy to sh start a new book is that all right with everybody or would you want to meditate i'm okay with anything if you want to meditate we can do that also just let me know so that you know uh, in the chat box whatever works for you all i'm happy to meditate i'm happy to we can start say so yeah i can get another response so that we know what timeline we are in all right start so we have a couple of books that we all know about right so now we have done messages from the masters we have done only love is real we've read many life many masters we've done mirrors of time and finally we have loved the healing stories in miracles happen now we have another beautiful book that dr weiss kept talking about which is in my line which is same soul many bodies so i'm going to be starting that beautiful book today onwards and let me bring that book in front of all of you okay sharing screen to many souls many bodies so this is the wonderful book that we are starting today discover and i thank pratima ji sonia uh, for their message about starting a book ankur i know you want to make it and maybe we can just start and made it also at the little end of it, if that's okay with you. Discover now what we will be doing in this wonderful book is discovering the healing power of future lives through progressive therapy, progression therapy, which means we are going to be going into the future world. Now, how this book will teach us is already we know that there is light, already we know that there is beautiful world of freedom when we cross over. But this book will give us a lot of idea about progression, which means what actually happens after we leave, right? So here we are. We start with the preface. Recently, I've been going to a place I've rarely been before, the future. When Catherine came to me as a psychiatrist patient 24 years ago, she recalled with stunning accuracy her travels into past lives she had led that were far apart as second millennium BC and the middle of the 20th century, thereby changing my life forever. Here was a woman who reported experiences and description from countries past that she could not have known in this life. And I, a Yale and Columbia trained psychiatrist, a scientist, and others were able to validate them. Nothing in my science could explain it. I only knew that Catherine was reporting what she had actually seen and felt. As Catherine's therapy progressed, she brought back lessons from the masters, incorporeal guides of spirits possessed of great wisdom, who surrounded her when she was detached from her body. The wisdom has informed my thought and governed my behavior ever since. Catherine could go deeply into the past and had such transcendent experiences that that could go so deeply into the past and had such transcendent experiences that Listening to her, I felt a sense of magic and mystery. Here were realms I never knew existed. I was exhilarated, astonished, and scared. Who would believe me? Did I believe myself? Was I mad? I felt like a little boy with a secret that when revealed would change the way we view life forever. Yet, I sensed that no one could listen. It took me four years to gather the courage to write of Catherine and my voyages in many lives, many masters. I feared I could be cast out of psychiatrist community, yet I became more and more sure that what I was writing was true. In the intervening years, my certainty, my certainty had solidified, and many others, patients and therapists, have acknowledged the truth of my findings. By now, I have helped more than 4,000 patients by bringing them back through hypnosis to the past lives. So my sense of shock for the fact of reincarnation, if not the fascination of discovery, has worn off. By now, the shock is back and I'm revitalized by the implications. I can now bring my patients into the future and see it with them. So while this book, Many Lives, Many Masters, 
they're going to be going to progression. So no more past life, a lot of progressive life. Actually, I tried to take Catherine into the future, but she talked only of her future, but of mine. Seeing my death clearly, it was unsettling to say the least. When your tasks are completed, your life will be ended. She told me, but there's much more time in that, much time. Then she drifted into a different level and I learned no more. Months later, I asked her if we could go into the future again. I was talk talking directly to masters, then as well to her subconscious mind as, her, as to her subconscious mind. And they answered for her, it is not allowed. Perhaps seeing the future would have frightened her too much. Or maybe the timing wasn't right. I was young and probably couldn't have dealt as competently with the unique danger of the progression of the future proposed as I can now. For one thing, progressing into the future is more difficult for a therapist than going into the past because the future has not yet happened. What if what a patient experiences is fantasy, not fact? How can we validate it? We can't. We know that what when we go back to past lives, events have already happened and in many cases can be proven. But let's suppose a woman of childbearing age sees the world as being destroyed in 20 years. I'm not going to bring a child into this world, she thinks. It will die too soon. Who's to say her vision is real, that her decision was logical? She'd have to be a very mature person to understand and when she saw might be a distortion, fantasy, metaphor, symbolism, the actual future, or perhaps a mixture of all of those. And what if a person foresaw his death in two ways? Sorry, what if a person foresaw his death in two years? A death caused by, say, a drunk driver? Would he panic, never drive again? Would the vision induce anxiety attacks? No, I told myself. Don't go there. I became concerned about self-fulfilling prophecy and an unstable person. The risks of acting on delusion were too great. Still over the 24 years since Catherine was my patient, a few others has gone into the future spontaneously. Often towards the end of their therapy, if I feel felt confident of the ability to understand that they were witnessing might be fantasy. I encourage them to go on, I say. This is about growth and experiencing, helping you now to make proper and wise decisions. But we're going to avoid any memories. Yes, memories of the future. Visions for connect uh, visions or connections to any death scenes or serious illnesses. This is only for learning and their minds would do that. The therapeutic value was appreciable. I found that these people were making wiser decisions and better choices. They could look at a near future, fork in the road and say, if I take this path, what will suggest? What it be better to take the other? And sometimes their look for the future could come true. Some people who come to me describe precognitive events, knowing what will happen before it happens. Researchers into near-death experiences Write about this. It's a concept that goes back to the pre-biblical times. Think of Cassandra who would accurately foretell the future, but who was never believed. The experience of one of my patients demonstrates the power and perils of pre of pre, pre sorry pre precognition. She began having dreams of the future, and often what she dreamt came to pass. The dream had precipitated her coming to me was of her son being in a terrible car accident. It was real, she told me. She saw it clearly and she panicked that her son would die in that way. Yet the man in the dream had white hair and her son was a dark-haired man of 25. Look, I said, feeling suddenly inspired, thinking of Catherine and sure that my advice was right. I know that many of your dreams have come true, but it doesn't mean that this one too will. There, These are spirits, whether you call them angels, guardians, guides or God, it's all higher energy, higher consciousness around us, and they can intervene. In religious terms, this is called grace, intervention by a divine being. Pray, send light, do whatever you can in your own way. She took my words literally and prayed, meditated, visited for, and revisualized till the accident happened. Only it wasn't a fatal one. 
there had been no need for her to panic. True, her son suffered head injuries, but there was no serious damage. Nevertheless, it was a traumatic event for him. When the doctors removed the bandages from his head, they saw that his hair had turned white. Until a few months ago, on those rare occasions when I progressed my patients forward, it was usually into their own lifetimes. I did the progressions only when I thought the patient was psychologically strong enough to handle them. And often I was so unsure as they were about to about the meaning of the scenes they brought back. Last spring, however, I was giving a series of lectures on the cruise ship. In such sessions, I often hypnotize my listeners en masse, then lead them into an earlier life and back again to the present. Some go back in time, some fall asleep, others stay there where they are, unhypnotized. This time, a member of the audience, Walter, a wealthy man who is a genius in the software business, went into the future of his own. And he didn't go into his own lifetime. He jumped a millennium ahead. He had come through dark clouds to find himself in a different world, some of the areas such as the Middle Age in North Africa were off limits, perhaps because of radiation damage. Perhaps because of an epidemic, but the rest of the world was beautiful. There were fewer people inhabiting it because of nuclear catastrophe. There were far fewer people in, there were fewer people nuclear catastrophe or plague or the lowering of the fertility rate. He remained in the countryside and so could not speak about cities, but the people were content, happy, even blissful. He said he hadn't the right words to describe their state. Whatever had thinned, the population had happened long before. What he saw was idyllic. He wasn't sure of the date, but he was sure that it was more than a thousand years from now. The experience helped him emotionally. He was rich enough to fantasize about changing the world, but now he realized no one could do that, there are too many politicians, he said, who are not open to the concepts of charity or global responsibility. The intention to make the world a better place was what mattered, along with the acts of charity he could personally perform. When he returned to this life, he felt a little sad, possibly because he was no longer in the idyllic future. He may have been grieving about the coming calamities, sensing its inevitability at some level, as most of us do. When he was awake, he described the vivid and powerful scenes and the feeling and sensations he'd experienced. This is one reason that I think that this is all imagination. Yet, the excitement did not come to matching mine, for I finally saw the implications. I'd come to learn that past, present and future are one. And what happens in the future can influence in the present, just as the past influences it. That night I wrote, we can go into the future if it's done wisely. The future, whether it's near or far, can be our guide. The future can be feeding back into the present to influence us now, into making better choices and decisions. We can change what we are doing now based on feedback from the future. And that changes our futures in a more positive direction. Think of what that means. As we have had limitless past lives, so will we have limitless futures again in the future once. Using a knowledge of what went before and what is to come, we may be able to shape the world's future and our futures. This ties into the ancient concept of karma. What you do shall you reap. If you plant better seeds, you grow better crops and perform better actions, your harvesting in the future will reward you. Since then, I've progressed many others. Some have progressed into their own life, some into a global future, science fiction, wish fulfillment, imagination. All these might explain what they saw, but so might the possibility that they were actually there. Perhaps the ultimate lesson I can draw from this lifetime is what the future holds and how we can all influence it. That knowledge, at least as much of it is as I have today, will color my next lives and yours in our voyage towards immortality. The future is born from the past. Nearly all my patients experience past life regret before they journey into the future. This route paves the way for increased understanding and allows them to make wise choices in the present. But the future is flexible and that we will be presenting 
in the future are the concepts that are addressed in this book. Compassion, empathy, non-violence, patience, spirituality are life lessons we all must learn. This book will show you why you they are crucial through the examples of some of my most remarkable patients and I will add some simple exercises to begin to teach you how to achieve them in this life. A few of you might even actually experience regressions, but don't be disappointed if they don't occur. If you master the lessons that this life and your next life will be happier, easier, emotionally richer and more fulfilled. What is more? If all of us learn them, the future itself will be better for us cumulatively since not only or not, we are all striving to achieve the ultimate goal, which is love. Chapter 1. Immortality Each of us is immortal. I don't mean simply that we pass on to our genes, our beliefs, our mannerisms and our ways to our children and they in turn to their children, though of course... We do. Nor do I mean that our accomplishments, the work of art, the new way of making shoes, the revolutionary idea, the recipe for blueberry pie, live after us. Though, of course, they do. I mean that the most important part of us, our soul, lives forever. Sigmund Freud described the mind as functioning on different levels. Among them is what he called the unconscious mind, of which we are not aware by definition, but which stores all experiences and directs us to act as we do, think as we do, respond as we do, feel as we do. Only by accessing the unconscious we saw can we learn who we are and that knowledge is we are able to heal. Some people have written that this is what soul is, fruits, unconsciousness. And in my work of regressing people and lately progressing people to their past and future lives so that they can more easily heal themselves this is what I see too, the working of the immortal soul. I believe that each of us possesses a soul that exists after the death of the physical body and that it returns time and time again to other bodies in a progressive effort to reach a higher plane. One of the questions that comes to me frequently is, where do the souls come from since there are so many people now that when the world started? I have posed this question to my patients and the answer is always the same. This is not the only place where there are souls. There are many dimensions, many different places of consciousness where there are souls. Why should we feel that we are the only place? There is no limit to energy. This is one school of many schools. Also, a few patients have told me that souls can split and have simultaneous experiences. There is no empirical evidence for this. The soul does not have a DNA, at least not the physical kind, described by the Nobel Prize winning scientists James Watson and Francis Crick. But the anecdotal evidence is overwhelming and to me, unassailably conclusive. I have seen it virtually every day since Catherine took me with her to past life as disparate as Arabia in 1863 BC and Spain in 1756. For example, there are Elizabeth and Pedro in Only Love Israel, lovers in former lives who came together again in this one, Linda in Through Time into Healing, guillotined in Scotland, married in Italy, centuries later to her present-day grandfather, and later still growing old in Holland, surrounded by her large and loving family, Dan, Laura, and hoping messages from the masters and some for 4,000 others. Some I've written about, some not, most not. Whose souls have journeyed through past lives, guiding the immortal part of them to the present? Some of these patients could speak into foreign languages of the past life they never learned or studied in this one. A phenomenon called genoglossy and a remarkable proof that they were reporting was true. When my patients remember themselves in their other lives, their traumas who had brought them to see me in the first place were eased and in some cases cured. That is one of the most, uh, that is one of the soul's primary purposes to progress towards healing. If it were only I had seen such cases, then you might be right in thinking I was hallucinating or had lost my mind. 
But Buddhists and Hindus have been accumulating past life cases for thousands of years. Reincarnation written in the New Testament and until the time of Constantine when the Romans censored it. Hmm. Jesus himself may have believed in it for he asked the apostles if they recognized John the Baptist or as Elijah returned. Elijah had lived 900 lives before John. It is a fundamental tenet of Jewish mysticism. In some sects, it was standard teaching until the early 19th century. Hundreds of other therapists have tapped thousands of past life sessions and many of their patients' experiences have been verified. I myself have checked specific deaths and events recorded in Catherine and others' past life memories, accurate deaths and events impossible to ascribe to false memory or fantasy. I no longer doubt that reincarnation is real. Our souls have lived before and will live again. That is our immortality. But just before we die, our soul, that part of us which is aware, when it leaves the body, pauses for a moment, floating in. In that state, it has differentiate, differentiate, it can differentiate color, hear voices, identify objects, and review the life as it has been departed. This phenomenon is called an out-of-body experience and it has been documented thousands of times, most famously by Elizabeth Kubler ross and Raymond Moody. Each of us experienced it when we die, but only a few have come back to present life to report on it. What has reported to me, I mentioned it briefly in Only Love is Real, now by the patient herself, but by her cardiologist as Mount Sinai Medical Center in Miami a scientist who's very academic and very grounded. The patient, an elderly diabetic, was hospitalized for medical tests. During her hospitalization, she had a cardiac arrest, her heart stopped beating, and she became comatose. Doctors held out little hope. Nevertheless, they worked feverishly on her and called on her cardiologist for help. He rushed into the intensive care unit and in doing so, dropped his distinctive gold pen, which rolled across the room and under window. During a short break in the resuscitation process, retrieved it. While the team worked on her, the woman reported later, she floated out of her body and watched the entire procedure from a point above the medicine cart near the window. She watched with great concentration since it was she who the doctors were working on. She longed to call out to them to assure them she was all right and they didn't have to work so frantically. But she knew they couldn't hear her when she tried to tap her cardiologist on the shoulder to tell him she was fine. Her, ha her hand went right through him and he felt nothing. She could see everything that was going through on around her body and hear every word her doctors said. Yet to her frustration, nobody could listen to her. The doctor's effort succeeded. The woman returned to life. I watched the whole process, she told her cardiologist. He was flabbergasted. You couldn't have. You were unconscious. You were comatose. There was a pen you dropped, she said. It must be very valuable. You saw it? I just told you I did, she said, and proceeded to describe the pen, the clothes, the doctor, the nurses wore, the suggestion of people who came in out of ICU, what each did, things nobody could have known without having been there. Cardiologist was still shaken days later when he told me about it. He confirmed that everything the woman related had indeed taken place and that her descriptions were accurate. Yet there was no question about that she was unconscious. Moreover, she had been blind for more than five years. Her soul had sight, not her body. Since then, the cardiologist has told me of dying patients who have seen familiar long deceased people waiting to take them to the other side. These were patients who were not on medications of any kind and were therefore lucid. One describes the grandmother waiting patiently in a chair in his hospital room for her time to come. Another was visited by a child who had died in infancy. The cardiologist noted that among the population of his patients, there were calmness, a serenity about dying. He learned to, tell, he learned to tell his patients, I'm very interested in what you feel, with what you experience, no matter how strange or unusual it may seem, you're safe in talking about it to me. When they did, the fear of death deceased, decreased. More commonly, 
those who were resuscitated report seeing light, often golden and at a distance as though at the end of a tunnel. Andrea, a news reporter for a major television network, allowed me to regress her as a demonstration described her life as Great Plains farm woman in the 19th century at the end of her life long, long lifetime. She rode above her body, watched it from afar, then she felt she was being drawn up into her light in the case, a blue one, becoming increasingly distant from her body and is going towards a new light, one that was as yet unclear. This is a common, almost classic near-death experience, except that Andrea describing the experience of someone in a past life herself who had been dead for more than 100 years. Where does a soul go after it leaves the body? I'm not sure. There may be no word for it. I call it another dimension, a higher level of consciousness, a physical state of consciousness. The soul certainly exists outside of the physical body and it makes connections not only in the other lifetimes of the person, just departed, but to all other souls. We die physically, but this part of us is indestructible and immortal. The soul is timeless. Ultimately, there is probably just one soul, one energy. Many people call this God, while others call it love again, and the name doesn't matter. I see the soul as a body of energy that blends with universal energy and splits off again. In fact, when it turns to a new life, before it merges the one, it looks down on the body it has just left and conducts what I call a life review, a review of the past, a life just departed. The review is undertaken in a spirit of loving kindness and caring. It is not for punishment, it is for learning. Your soul registers this experience. It feels appreciation and gratitude of everyone you have helped and everyone you have loved in a heightened way now that it has left the body. Similarly, it feels the pain, anger and despair of everyone you have hurt or betrayed, again magnified. In this way, the soul learns not to do harmful things, but to do, be compassionate. Once the soul has finished its review, it seems to go further from your body, often finding the beautiful light as Andrea's ancestor did. Although this may not happen immediately, it doesn't matter. The light is always there. Sometimes there are other souls around. You could call them masters or guides, who are very wise and help your soul on the journey towards the one. At some level, your soul merges with the light, but it still retains its awareness so that it can continue to learn on the other side. It is simultaneously so that it can so it is a simultaneous merging with the greater light at the end of the immortal journey. The merging will be complete, accompanied by feelings of indescribable bliss and joy and the awareness that it remains individuated and still has lessons to learn, both on earth and on the other side. Eventually, the time varies, the soul describes to come back in another body, and when it reincarnates, the sense of merging is lost. Some people believe there is a profound sadness at the separation from this glory. This bliss is the merging of energy and light, and it may be so. On earth, in the present, we are individuals, but individuation is an illusion characteristic of this place, this dimension, this planet. Yet we are there as real and substantial as the chair on which you may be seated, sitting as you are read. But scientists know that as a chair, it is just atoms and molecules and energy. It is chair and it is energy. We are human, finite, and we are immortal. I think that at this highest level of all souls are connected or grand delusion and we are individual uh, even sorry I think at this highest level all souls are connected it is an illusion or grand delusion that we are individuated separate even as that pertains here we are nevertheless connected to every body every soul thus in a different sphere we are all one on this world, our bodies are dense and physically heavy. They suffer from illness and disease, but in higher dimensions, I believe in physical, I believe only pure consciousness. And beyond that, in realms, we cannot comprehend and where all souls are one, even time doesn't exist. This means that past and present and future lives we may be occurring simultaneously. I'm a medical doctor and a psychiatrist and healing is my life's passion. I believe we are each instinctively motivated towards spiritual healing 
and spiritual growth towards understanding and compassion towards evolution. I believe we move spiritually forward, not backward. The, the unconscious or subconscious or superconscious mind and soul has been built within. It is a mechanism that steers it always a positive path of spiritual evolution. In other words, the soul always at all times evolves through health. At a high level, time is measured in lessons learned. Though on earth it is chronological, we live both in time and out of it. Our past and future lives converge in the present. And if they can induce us towards healing, now we have a current lives which are healthy and more spiritually fulfilled. We will make progress. This feedback loop is continuous, trying to get us to improve our future lives, even as we live out of this one. Today they will be it, and tomorrow we will start from here. And now let's just meditate for a couple of minutes before we end this session. That's what Uncle had wanted. Let's all do that. So I request everyone to get comfortable. You don't have to have your back straight. If you wish, you can. Close your eyes. Be aware of your breath. No need for forceful breathing. Just how you're breathing in and out. If you require help, maybe you can put your hand on your stomach or your diaphragm. And as you're working with your breath, let's be grateful for this wonderful bluish white, golden white. Mother Earth has given the golden light and Father Universe has given us the bluish white healing light. Both these lights have mixed and we are right now seated in the middle of such a healing ball. Seated or lying down, however we are choosing. And this is our time for healing. Our bodies are made up of trillions of cells. Some of these cells have become out of ease. And hence in the physical body, they have manifested into a dis-ease. And right now, right here, we are going to heal those disease cells to come in harmony with the other ones and get that equilibrium back in our physical bodies. So on an etheric level, feel yourself stepping out of your body, viewing your body as the way it is. And scan this beautiful body with your hands as if they have extra lights and see which part is hurting. Obviously, you on a physical level know that that part of yours really hurts, whether it's your back or your stomach or your legs or whichever part. And wherever you find in scanning, the energy flow change, that is a part that needs healing. And now, the energy, the healing energy is already surrounding us. It's already around us. Let's welcome it inside of us. Especially in the area where we are not at ease. And allow the light to flow through those pores in that area. And also allow the light to enter in your body through other areas. More concentrated on that other area, but also in other parts of your body. Now, why do we give this light, this space in our body? Because there is already a lot of light. But maybe that light has dimmed a bit. Just the way... In a room, if you put a 100 watt bulb, it's very luminescent. But if you put a 0 watt bulb, it's very dim. Similarly, this added on light is now illuminating your inner world. 
Now, wherever the blockages are, they are being able to be seen so much more clearly. And here is where our healing has begun from around us, that surrounds us, is now inside of us. Feel enveloped in the warmth of this healing light because now the healing light is traveling in your body in all possible directions. There's a rays and rays and rays of light crisscrossing, moving so far, so rapidly. And whichever part you think needs healing, allow the light to enter it, to heal it. You may find a shift in how your energy is in a while and you may find that a little later, maybe a day or two later, but be a believer and allow the healing to right now happen. It doesn't matter how physically your body is, where it is. Right now you're working on emotional energy healing. Feel the healing. Feel the magic. And today, for the entire day, this beautiful ball that you see today in will be around you. Whether you're drinking, eating, talking, walking. This wonderful ball of light, the healing ball of light, of energy, of love and light is with you. Until you burst it and ask it to go back to where it came from, which is another world of love and light. Feel yourself being cleansed. All the extra stuck up food in your digestive area being thrown out. Excretory system. That's the most important reason why people fall sick. Feel the healing. And be so grateful for this ball of light that's shining bright. And this note, let's just be grateful for this wonderful light that he stays with us throughout the day. And let's bow in gratitude to all the light beings. And I thank each one of you for sharing this sacred space. And enjoy this beautiful ball of light. If you think you're done with it, you can say a thank you and it will be leaving you. If you're happy for it to stay, allow it to stay until you feel the healing has happened. With lots of love and light, let's keep shining bright, bright here, right now. I'll see you in the gap tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much.